So welcome to the Intune Whisper. Our show is all about the future of work and technologies. So today's guest is Justin Spears. He is the founder and CEO of MXI Consulting. Don't worry, he'll tell us what that means. He is also a fractional CGO, and if you don't know what that is, you're going to learn more about that. And he is also with M3D Technologies. And you guys, if you remember, you got to have that uh, interview the previous week with Matthew Hogan. He is, uh, Justin is an innovation and growth expert that helps business owners build teams and teach effectiveness as the cornerstone of success. He is a Navy veteran that developed and implemented scalable programs in both military and civilian industries, directed change initiatives, facilitated transformation, and led process modification and continuous improvements across multiple facets of organizations. Welcome to the show, Justin. Thank you for having me. I met you at ITSEC, and you started talking to me all about chatbots. So we're going to hold that off, and we're going to talk about it later in the show. But I'm really glad that you're here, and I was on your email list. And for anybody that's listening to the show, they should definitely sign up, because his email newsletters are very entertaining and informative and educational. So our show is always about the future of learning, technology, and industries and jobs. So I asked you for five words, and these are the words you gave me. Strategist. Why strategist? I think it's a different way to think. Um, that's why I say strategist is, you know, we, we're given things at face value in front of us. There's, you know, a status quo of how things are done. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that identifies the opportunity available. So as a strategist... I like to see how can we create unseen opportunities? How can we mm. create unfair advantages for businesses? How can we do things new, innovative? Everything from parenting strategies and parenting strategies and business, business strategies and technology. You know, you mentioned AI and my chatbot switch. I can pull it up on my phone so it'll join us if you want. Oh, we <laughs> might do that. It's a different way to think. It's thinking outside the box. Mm. Very interesting. Accelerator. Now, typically we think about accelerators as a place where we can go as a startup to be able to grow and be nurtured. But what, are you, what do you call this within yourself? So uh, it's actually the same thing. So I embody what those accelerators do. So as a strategy and growth ex consultant, I view myself as an accelerator. I come in, I work with businesses, I work with organizations. Rather than going to a you know accelerator uh, space, I work with them, do a deep dive, and really get into a great relationship <laughs> where bless you, Thank where you. we can grow their business. So using that strategic mindset, how do we put pen on you know pen to paper here and actually accelerate businesses and organizations? Connector. Mm -hmm. I love partnerships. I love teaming. Um, strategic partnerships and teaming have been. The cornerstone of my success, um, and, and I view it not and not just success in business, but success in community. Um, I have great partnerships in my personal life. I have great partnerships uh, in my faith, in my business relationships, and what I do. I'm connected with a number of nonprofits that I work with. That you know, I provide services from my business. They help my business. We get people connected. Absolutely. Mm, I like that word too. Veteran, thank you for your service. We are always appreciative of people that serve, and when we don't. My pleasure. Thank you. So veteran, um, you know, I grew up with everybody in my family serving in some branch of the military. Uh, I kind of fought the family business for a while and didn't go in until I was 25. Um, and, you know, so I growing up, you know, as a military dependent and then going in um, to the military and specifically the Navy myself, really embodying what that means um, and learning even how to, you know, I've learned over the years how to articulate what it means. And I speak to different organizations and even government departments, things like that, on what it means to, to be a veteran business owner, a veteran entrepreneur, a veteran speaker, whatever that is. It's, it is different, um, but it also embodies a lot of core values and it brings a difference to the table. Mm. Uh, next one was entrepreneur. Yeah, I love entrepreneurship. Um, been passionate about it since I was a kid. Um, starting, you know, businesses. I was cutting hay. I'd go around and pick up, you know, cutting hay. Where did you live? I lived in Western Washington, and so okay. I grew up in an area that was very close to ranches and farms. And my summers after school on weekends was very much spent uh, 
hay fields um, with cattle on cattle farms, alfalfa fields, things like that. And so, you know, I 12, 13 years old, I'm cutting fields. Um, I'm working, you know, on the weekends from, you know, 5 a.m. to 6 a.m., picking up golf balls. I'd go and pick up, you know, anything in neighbors' yards, dog poop to, you know, fix in their gardens, anything I could to really work for myself. Mm. Um, and then now, you know, years later, I have a passion for entrepreneurship so much that my business degree is actually in entrepreneurship. Um, so I get to spend years studying what does it mean to start businesses? What does it mean to help people start businesses? So it became a passion of mine of not just from the businesses I've started um, and, and owned as well, but also if somebody has a passion for entrepreneurship, how can I support them so they can see their passion grow? Mm. Well, those are all great words. I would definitely say, yes, I see them in you. Um, let's talk about your educational background. Where did you go to school and how did you get to where you are now? And then be sure to explain what the names of your companies mean. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, it kind of an interesting background on the education side. Um, I didn't start going to formal education, so college, until 25, actually 26, a year after I joined the Navy. Prior to that, um, did trade school, so uh, an apprentice carpentry uh, a tradesman, an apprentice welder. Uh, like I said, grew up in that area where we went to trade schools. Um, you know, I worked for construction companies, and then uh, when the recession hit, it was time to join the family business because um, construction industry kind of tanked. And you know, going to the military, um, you know, one of my biggest motivators was I need I need to get a formal education, um, and so I spent ten years going to full time school. Um, not because I had to, but because I actually love it. I love learning. Mm. So my, my undergrad in associates was very focused on medical uh, and some other uh, security, um, so pre-law, things like that. Um, did my undergrad in social and criminal justice, studied a lot of forensics, things like that, pre-law focus. Um, and then I got hurt in the military. Yeah, so that led me into you know a new season of evaluation as I'm kind of rehabilitating from an accident I was in um, and then facing the new uh, idea that, you know, I'm transitioning out of the military. What does that look like? Um, you know, my path towards uh, doing, um, you know, law and security work uh, for military and homeland security is now over. My medical side's over um, due to some instability in my legs and even the construction industry is over for me now. I can't do that labor. So I spent some time and it's like, you know, between my wife, myself, like, God, what are we doing? And uh, I was like, you know, I really love what I do in like operations and business management. And I did a lot with, um, you know, strategy and kind of a, you know, they say entrepreneur role when I was mm -hmm. in the military of, I started a number of departments. So I had to learn how to, you know, from ideation to implementation, what that looks like. And they sent me some great schools to learn it too. So after I got out of the military, um, I, uh, we moved up to uh, Northern California. I went to Simpson University, and I did my master's in intellectual leadership at A.W. Tozer Theological Seminary, mm. uh, which was a great foundation for formalizing my understanding of um, leadership from a philosophical and theological point of view. And, you know, not focusing on your traditional route of, you know, leading a church or something like that. It was more focused, and my intent was, how do I develop this solid foundation of understanding to lead businesses, mm -hmm. to lead the community? Um, that, that's been my passion. So um, I ended up doing my, um, my uh, final capstone. Uh, it was called Military Higher Education as a Holistic Ministry. So I wrote an entire program for the university. Um, and then when the president found out about it, he said, hey, I, you have to work here and build this. I don't know what it looks like, but I want you here. Yeah, and so now you didn't know how to start this. No, no. So I spent um, three and a half years studying uh, intellectual leadership and what that means and building these programs. Um, and then I had the opportunity to actually build that at Simpson University. It was a thriving program, built it. Within the first year, we were actually ranked number 11 Christian college in the U.S. for veterans. Wow. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we were doing so much in the community. It was absolutely great. And then after a year break, um, you know, I had the academic itch again, um, <laughs> which was good. I was planning on taking a two-year break, but one year was plenty. I wanted to get back into studies. Um, so I actually did my MBA um, in entrepreneurship and innovation out of Florida International University in Miami. Mm. Um, loved it. Loved going to the Chapman Graduate School of Business. Um, it, it was a phenomenal understanding of 
how to build businesses, what it means to build businesses, but from a different lens of more of the preparation and the planning side, which is unique because what I found over the years, even before being a growth and strategy consultant is most entrepreneurs, they may have a business model or a plan they're going after, but I come in and I help them from that formal understanding of what's strategic planning, what are initiatives, right? what are partnerships, things like that. So that way, businesses can be more proactive mm -hmm. than reactive, which is a common thing that we see in, in entrepreneur worlds is being reactive for a very long period of time and then kind of cleaning up the mess once you get you know your footing going. And so you know, I learned some really interesting um, uh, principles and philosophies. I've got some great chair and, and you know, even some professors I stay in touch with, absolutely. Learned a lot from them. And then on the innovation side was, you know, whether it's a program, a service, or technology, you know, what does it mean to actually innovate? You know, are you revolutionary or evolutionary? Um, Good points. Absolutely. Very different, and people don't think about that. Very. Well, everything, everything innovative, it falls into those two categories. Mm -hmm. Are you building something that is a complete disruptor that nobody's done before, so it's evolutionary? Or are you enhancing something? And you could be a disruptor also, but then you could be a differentiator. Mm -hmm. um, and you got to figure out, like, what is, what is your business model and your product? How is it going to evolutionize? And so those are the two categories I focus on when we're talking products, services, technology, things like that. So I, I finished that up um, and then, um, you know, along the way, um, started a charter school. So a team of uh, some really great colleagues and friends of mine back in California. We started a K through 12 charter school in wow. Northern California. First year was 428 students. It's called Phoenix Charter Academy. They're doing absolutely amazing and thriving. Um, one of the hardest things I've done was to resign from that board um, when I left the state of California. Um, but I'm happy to come back to Florida and they're doing very well. I stay in touch with them. Um, I worked for a software company for a while, built a very large technology division focusing on simulation. Um, and so kind of a lot of the areas I focus on is really coming in and working with a variety of you know niche companies to, to learn how to build, how to grow, how to innovate. Mm. And do you sell this also online for people that want to partake in an online service or do you run it as cohorts or what do you do? Yeah, so I do teach some master classes um, and I do teach classes for different nonprofits and different organizations as well. Um, but I do offer my services completely available online through my website too. Oh, and you have a new workbook. Tell us about it. Yeah, so that's fun. I, I love, um, well, as you've seen from my newsletter, there's a number of yeah. workbooks that I share. Uh, and I have um, a portal for uh, my clients. It's called the MXI Knowledge Vault. And I built this out and it houses a number of downloadable documents, uh, published works that are, you know I exclusively made. So I have you know uh, white papers and workbooks on understanding unfair advantage, understanding what does it mean to be a holistic entrepreneur? Um, this idea that you can work a nine to five and then go home as an entrepreneur is a myth. So let's, let's understand that and realize how do we become a holistic entrepreneur with a realistic expecta expectation of personal, professional time management and balance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, there, there's uh, many others in there that I'm working with. Uh, I provide SWOT analyses, tutorials, so how to do market research, templates even. I don't want my clients and partners that I work with that I provide this to, to even be researching all over Google, you know, which template do I use? Mm -hmm. uh, I've done a lot of research. I've done a lot of work uh, with some great industry leaders. So I provide these things to people. Very nice. And most recently, actually three weeks ago, I got it back from the publisher, uh, is my new workbook. It's a 10 week workbook on developing a strategic growth mindset. Um, so I found over the years that you may, people may be given an understanding. They may be given a resource to learn but if they don't have the right mindset to go into it, then, you know, it, it's kind of, um, you know, at that point, it's almost entertainment value. It, it's not actionable. Um, so like with a lot of the companies I work with, I work to help them understand. And so that's why I have these types of workbooks. So I found that kind of an issue in the entrepreneurial world where people are trying to understand concepts like, you know, unfair advantages, strategic initiatives, partnerships. Like I wrote an article on uh, understanding competitive intelligence and competitive partnerships. Most people I talked to didn't understand how that was different than knowing that their competitor had a similar product. So, well, it's very different. It's a much deeper understanding. 
Um, and so I wrote this workbook on exercises. So there's an exercise every week for 10 weeks on things that I've done over the years and things that I've learned and implemented in my life to really have that mindset of being open to strategic growth, how to think strategically. And it even has some great exercises on reevaluation of some of your thought processes previously. Hmm. I'm looking forward to uh, learning more about that. So just to tell our listeners, where would they go? We usually do this at the end, but I want to do it here. Where would they go for your website? What is the website? So my website is Mm -hmm. mxiconsulting.com. And if you want the workbook, try and remember it, it's go.mxiconsulting.com forward slash growth mindset. Got it. What does MXI mean? MXI is an abbreviated version of MetaX Innovations, which is what my company was originally called uh, almost six years ago when I started it. Um, and then, uh, you know, with the birth of Meta and things like that, it was it was good to do a rebrand. Yeah. Um, and Meta actually doesn't stand for anything digital. It stands for metanoia, which is a Greek term of doing things differently, rethinking mm. and creating a new understanding X for Christ. I want Christ in the center of all my businesses and innovation. Again, how are we evolutionary or revolutionary? So the mantra is how do we do things differently than it's been done in the past Mm -hmm. that are innovative? So it impacts our families, it impacts our communities, and really it helps entrepreneurs. I love that. So you're also the growth officer here, fractional growth. So why don't you explain what a a fractional anything is? Mm -hmm. So our listeners, because we don't, I don't think we've ever talked about that. Yeah. So I love, I love the, uh, actually I was um, conversing with a gentleman this morning uh, who leads the fractional revolution, uh, I think is what he calls it. And so the wave of fractional roles in um, businesses Really, I mean, it's been around for a number of years, but COVID really launched this trend. Um, And it's a great strategy. I've been recommending it for years to people. We never really called it a fractional. Um, You know, we would call, you know, people, it was, we'd give them like a CEO, COO, but everybody had the understanding that this person was part time. So, fractional is a great strategic resource for entrepreneurs, for small businesses, medium businesses that, they may not need a full-time C-suite or senior director. They may not need a CFO 40 to 60 hours a week. Um, And so a fractional role gives you the expertise you need with the experience in a more scalable role. So, I mean, in the fractional community, I have lots of friends um, that I've made that fractional chief marketing officers, chief revenue officers, chief operating. We're seeing CEOs, which I think is great. Mm-hmm. Um, be, and, you know, I have another connection. He's a, he's a fractional CEO for three companies. Mm-hmm. Huh. And they're past the startup phase. They're in full operation. Is it like they're wanting to transition from whoever the startup uh, CEO was to a, a replacement? So usually what we're seeing is they're in a business model. They're in a landscape currently where... They say they don't have the revenue to support a CEO because they're in a huge vertical or a lift right now, or they're in startup mode. And you know, once you know the the business plan is once they get certain number of you know millions in revenue annually, then we'll grow that position to full time. But you still need those professional services and that professional expertise yeah. to impact the business and grow it along the way. So you know, it's kind of a shift of you know, a technologist or a business manager starting a business and needing to bring in, you know, a, a engineer full-time or needing to bring in a uh, MBA full-time. It's now, okay, well, I have an idea for a business. I'm going to bring this person in a fractional role to help me with the limited revenue and capital I have. I'm going to bring this person in and we're going to set benchmarks for growth where those roles will transition mm-hmm. into full-time later on. So I think it's a great strategy for startups and small businesses. And we're seeing um, a lot of the small businesses that are using the fractional model, they're being able to grow and implement their strategic plans a lot faster, mm-hmm. a lot more lean, and get to that middle, uh, that medium-sized business size that is now requiring a full-time CEO, a full-time mm-hmm. you know, VP, things like that. So I, I think it's a great resource. And you know, on the on the on the employee side or the subcontractor side as a fractional, 
It creates a lot of flexibility and time. It creates a lot of capability in your own life. Like myself, you know, I'm, I'm not tied to one thing. I like to be tied to many things. Mm -hmm. That's my personality. That's, you know, that's something I embody and love. So being able to be a fractional, I think is a great resource for both companies and, and the workforce as well. Yeah, I definitely see the economic side to it for sure. It's nice to have, I think, somebody else that you can bounce ideas past that would either have a shared industry experience or, you know, a totally different perspective, maybe one that brings more value as to what they're selling mm. to potential customers. So I like this idea. I've heard of Fractional for a while. I don't know how long it's been around, but it is something that I heard about in quite a few of the accelerators I was in. Yeah, it's a great idea. Okay, so we're going to do something fun. We're going to be able to stand up here. So this is probably going to be the last time I do this one with my uh, my listeners. But I watched this show, Grey's Anatomy, mm -hmm. and one of the doctors, before she would go into surgery, she would assume uh, Wonder Woman, the superhero pose. You've seen it before with either Superman or Wonder Woman. Feet are slightly apart, uh, fists are on your hips, and then you're gazing off, your chest is out, and it totally makes you feel empowered. Now, two people down at the office where I work have done this. And they're like, I don't know, they're 21, 22, they come in. And then that's their body stance when they come in. So we're going to do this. Let's do we're it. We're going to stand up. Yes. And then we're out and we're just like gazing off. Yes. I feel so strong, so empowered. Yes. Awesome. I, I feel like young Sheldon. <laughs> young Sheldon. That is very <laughs> true. <laughs> and that's a good show. It is. Yeah. It is. I'm going to be sad not to see young Sheldon anymore. <laughs> but word on the street is there's a, another one coming up behind it. We'll have to figure out a new pose once that show goes some, away. Some type of, I don't know. I think it's pretty true, <laughs> that research. So what are your thoughts about this type of behavior? And do you think it instills confidence? Absolutely. Um, you know, it kind of goes back to a lot of the mind-body practices. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I mentioned earlier about understanding holistic entrepreneurship, you know, as somebody who's been through career changes, um, you know, different traumas and things like that, you know, I've instilled a lot about mind-body practices in my life. Um, you know, recovering from burnout to learning, you know, hey, how am I going to parent in a digital world, which is a whole new thing. Um, mind-body practices like this where we empower ourselves, we, cre you know, create that space in ourselves to build confidence, to give ourselves affirmations, to kind of disconnect for a little bit, to focus on, you know, Head to toe scans and what's going on, and be like, okay, I, I'm I'm going into this. Let me, you know, give myself a little, you know, uh, a hype session here. I'm gonna stand up. I'm gonna be a thought leader, superhero. I got this. I do that every time I go into teaching a master class. Every time I go into teaching workshops. I have one coming up at the end of this month where I'm teaching executive presence to a group of veteran uh, entrepreneurs and veteran business owners and executive. One of my favorite topics. Mm. I'm gonna Wait, do that, that right be before. Is that going to be with Fabob? It is going to be with Fabob. Oh, Absolutely. well, I'll have to sign up for that one. Yeah, I'll send you the link to it. It's going to be great. It's oh. uh, one of their Salute to Success uh, workshops. And um, this one coming up January 26th here in East Orlando uh, under Fabob, the Florida Association of Veteran Owned Businesses. I'm going to be teaching, I think it's two hours. Don't quote me on that. It might be three on executive presence, how to hold yourself, how to you know understand things, how to be an empathetic leader while still you know, having their best interest in mind while still focusing on the business, while demanding a presence, while pretty much everything else yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in a healthy in way. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. Well, what would you want to be remembered for in your life? I would want to be remembered for the impact I've made on my family and community. Family, um, you know, as we said earlier, the five uh, words there, connectedness. My family is my most important thing. Faith, family, uh, my friends, my, a lot of my friends are my family. Um, so that's a big one, um, you know, building a healthy community, uh, thriving community. I've got some great people in my life. Um, and, you know, so family and community and, you know, that community uh, is not just personal, it's also professional. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, like I said, I have a number of organizations that I work with from Fabob to the Camaraderie Foundation that I work great with um, locally. I'm actually their class advisor. So... Again, going back to I like to do a lot of things, um, mm -hmm. but you know, even in the local area, you know, working with community leaders and 
hosting these classes for the community, things like that. I want, and even some of the impact I'm doing with, you know, downtown Orlando and some of the initiatives going on. I love the city beautiful. Absolutely love it. I love this place so much. I think it's the greatest city in the whole U.S. And that's why I live here. Um, and so I look at that community as not just personal, but also professional and local. Mm. Yes, that is why we all live here. We have these two or three months in the spring and in the fall where it's the most glorious weather ever. Not right now because it is cold. It's cold one day and hot another. See, I love the nine, ten months of the year. I think that's the really? glorious weather. I oh. love the heat. Okay. Absolutely. I, I was at Disney when it was, what, 120, 117 degrees, the hottest day last year? Whoa. Oh, yeah. I'm crazy about it. <laughs> okay. Well, I like the heat, too. I do not want to be where it's cold. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a moment just to acknowledge our sponsor, Cat5 Studios, and we will be right back. The Intern Whisperer is brought to you by Cat5 Studios, who help you create games and videos for your training and marketing needs that are out of this world. Visit Cat5 Studios for more information to learn how Cat5 Studios can help your business. Thank you, Cat5 Studios. Now we're back into the second half of our show where we talk about the future of jobs and industries in 2030. So there is no right or wrong answer. What do you think 2030 will look like from the world perspective, your industry, you know, strategic growth, and potential jobs? So I think we're already starting to see the birthplace of that shift. Um, you know, in the last three years, we've seen, um, you know, this, this corporate exiting and not, not resigning, not the great resignation, I'm not referring to that, of the physical exit. What is a virtual hybrid? What does a remote work look like? Um, and we're still figuring out a lot of that. I think that that is the birthplace of where we're gonna be in 2030 because it's helping the industry leaders and the thought leaders to start focusing on one, what does the new workplace look like? But the key thing and one of my favorite things is what is the impact of Web 3.0 and technology look like in that? Um, there, there's no longer a separation. Our entire economy, our business landscape, it doesn't matter what business is, follows a cyclical cycle of technology development now. We used to have five-year strategic plans. You know, I do strategic consulting all the time. If somebody tells me I have a five-year plan, I say, two years tops. Yeah. Technology is new every two years. And if your business isn't keeping up with it, you're behind. That is true. So I true. have clients that come to me and it's like, hey, we're on our fourth year. We need to start planning for five. I was like, you're three years behind. Mm -hmm. You know, so technology actually grows and motivates and steers our economy anymore, our business cycles. Yep. Um, it's changed so much. So now how do we... How do we look at a new workforce? How do we look at a new you know, economic landscape, a business landscape in 2030 that encompasses AI, Web 3.0, the metaverse, AR, you know, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, mm -hmm. things like that. What does that look like? And you know, even now we're starting to see prototypes, and I, I do some of it too because I'm fascinated by tech and I work in tech also, is you know, I have an AR headset that I wear at home that has multiple screens, so like I can watch football while I'm in a you know a Zoom meeting. Yes, guilty, I've done that. Wow, that's yeah. hard to do while cooking because okay. it's augmented reality. So I can you know have a TV streaming on my headset here while we're talking, you know, or I'm talking with my kids and you know help my son with my homework, and it's like there's a meeting here going on that you know I need to be engaged in. I'm hearing some key points. I got an AI bot in there that'll actually highlight when I you know I need to focus on something. So it's, it's a new area of multitasking. It's a new area of being lean because of the technology advances and because the launch of, you know, core, you know uh, business landscape reevaluations. So I think in 2030, we're going to see a whole new landscape of what it looks like. I think that we're going to have, you know, I think we're going to see more co-working centers, but innovative co-working centers where you can come into, you know, uh, uh, essentially like a hollow port type room and have your area to work. You know, I know I take my headset to my one of my co-working offices and people think I'm probably weird because I'm touching stuff that isn't there. Mm -hmm. um, but now you're interactive, mm -hmm. you know, and with the integration of like haptics and biofeedback, you can wear a suit under your suit that you can feel, mm -hmm. you know, so if you want to go on a walk with your spouse while you're traveling, you can, you can hold hands and feel mm -hmm. it. You know, I've done it. Yeah. You know? And so I think that 
from an innovation standpoint, we're, we're seeing a completely new landscape of work. I think that's changing everything. And I think that the companies that are starting to understand it, starting to put initiatives in place of what does this look like? How do we start embodying this? And it's, it's not a one size fits all. It's not everybody work remote. It's not everybody work on site. It's not everybody work hybrid. You know, there's companies out there that are putting together regional work hubs where employees can come to. So when you say a regional work hub, is this for the company or would it be like just an office center where what we have where people, okay, there's a business center over here, um, kind of like a coffee shop, if you will, mm -hmm. but something yeah, of that like nature. co-working sites, uh, things like that. There's big, been a big birth and even, you know, a rethink of co-working, uh, the co-working, uh, you know, businesses. But really it's centered around how do we get the job done by providing the most flexibility to our teams. So it's creating a new value system for our employees and getting away from, you know, an employee does this, it's a team member contributes this. So if they need to go visit family, you know, they're based in a, a company here in central Florida and they need to go visit family for say four months. They got, you know, so a family member that's sick. They can go to Portland, Oregon for four months, do the exact same job. They may need to travel back and forth a little mm -hmm. bit if they need to be on the site or if they don't, how can they still meet their objectives, impact the company and the company be support and be supportive of them using these new innovative technologies? I like this whole concept too. It's something that I see many times um, when I've read some of the real estate news is that office buildings are empty. They're talking about turning them into apartments mm -hmm. so that people you know, can live in the city that way. But I do feel like there's going to be a swing when businesses will be coming back, asking mm -hmm. people to be more, much more hybrid than where they are now. I've also seen a huge shift where companies, larger companies, are downsizing and they're looking at how can they be more efficient. So it takes me to this place of where AI fits into mm -hmm. some of this. And this is uh, a conversation you and I had had over there at ITSEC, mm -hmm. uh, where there's chatbots that can be of assistance. But it could be that I have, I don't know, five chatbots that could be streamlining things for me. What do you think that would look like in just a regular business? Because I'm in the HR field, but I can see that it would be applicable to just about anybody in a business that you're there to help them with strategic growth. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's a great question. So, And that goes into the integration of Web 3.0 that I was talking about is, you know, with the advancements of AI, you know, I speak on this a lot, is no one should lose their job to AI. Okay, I'm, I'm a firm advocate of that. Um, either the, the employee or team member is doing something that is prohibiting the adoption and integration of it, or business management, mm -hmm. I think it is, is ill-fitting of the new Web 3.0 environment. Okay, so there's different aspects if somebody loses their job, but it shouldn't be we're going to implement AI, you lose your job. Mm -hmm. Okay. I am a firm believer, and I actually work with a number of companies on how to integrate AI into their business practices, into their business operations. Okay. I'm a firm believer that with, you know, everything I talked about of preparation for 2030, and even along the way, we have one, we have to be agile. Okay. We can't just wait for something to be perfect and then implement it. They, the waterfall methodologies and philosophies are out the window. They've been gone for 10 plus years. Right. We have to be agile. Everything is quick to market, pivot, change, quick to market, pivot, change. Okay. So in doing that, how do we do that with our businesses? Well, you know, I, I, I did, was on a show uh, a few months ago talking about AI bots. And I actually did a demo of how I created, I programmed an AI, not an engineer, not a software programmer. And I used AI to teach me how to program an AI bot to do some certain administrative tasks for me. So now what I'm doing is I'm working with organizations, specifically in operations and HR, how do we expand your HR, your, your HR field? How do we expand your operational team so that you can emulate a larger company? To, that creates your new scale-up model. That be, creates a new growth model. Right. So I have a whole program of where I work with HR, I work with operations to come in and train bots 
to be employees of current employees. Mm-hmm. One of the biggest measures, if you look at some of these big corporations out there, a lot of times they, they don't always measure themselves off annual revenue and annual capital. They'll say, oh, we have 20,000 employees. Well, what if you're a small business and say you have 40 employees? Well, you wanna to get to 100 employees. Okay, so get your employees employees. So what if the new concept is, the new innovation is, if you're, say you have an HR manager and you gotta do all this onboarding, what if you build an AI bot that can do it for every single person that onboards? You can build, even again, with Web 3.0 and AR VR, you can actually build virtual environments with AI integration where you're, you know, Isabel, you're sitting there actually talking to someone, your avatar is. You know, when we had this conversation, I started Googling, like, how do I build a chatbot? And, mm-hmm. you know, and I was looking it up. Some of it was more technical than my, yeah. you know, expertise because I am not a, I'm not a programmer and, or anywhere in that space. Um, but I was intrigued by it. And there are things that will build it for you, even some self-build mm-hmm. is what I found. Yeah. So I think this is really intriguing because for startups, this could be a solution. It is, it really is. And this is one of my favorite things to actually consult on and advise on is how, and and I spend a lot of time following all the AI platforms out there. You know, X has one and Google has one and everybody wants to have one now. They're great. Um, And they're not all a one size fits all. Certain tools do certain things. You can train them. I've trained them to interact with each other and advise on each other. So I have one that creates one that critiques will generate a prompt telling this one how to do it better. So it tra- they're self-training now. But you know, for a lot of the tasks that we expect employees to do to you know, meet operational goals, there's a good amount that we can build AI bots for and even host them locally. So you can train them and host them locally, even um, you know, if there's security concerns, things like that. And so it allow, it, we're giving productivity resources to our employees. Mm-hmm. Many surveys out there in the business world tell us, you know, what is the number one thing employees want? I need more resources. I need more help. Yeah. We'll give it to them. This is the number one resource to give to them. Absolutely. I know they could probably help with onboarding and offboarding and some of those repetitive mm-hmm. tasks for sure. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, I know we're getting pretty close to where we have to be able to wrap some things up here. What do you think ethical dilemmas would be with using any of this AI? Yeah, so one of the ethical dilemmas is cutting jobs. Absolutely. It's probably one of the biggest talked about ethical dilemmas. Do we implement a, you know, a intelligent solution to replace jobs? Um, again, Just because we can doesn't mean we should, right? Correct. And that's why... I advise companies, and my program even, is designed to help companies train employees to be operators of AI. Mm. So it doesn't matter what your role is now. Everybody's job, kind of like in, you know, in the military, everyone's job is to be a combatant, unless you're a chaplain. Mm-hmm. And then you have a specialty. So everyone's job is now an operator of AI. And you're an accountant. You're an operator of AI. Yeah and you're a strategic planner, you're an operator of AI and you're a project manager, you're an operator of AI and you're a software developer. Everybody needs to learn how to, you know, implement a AI training program. And specifically like we were talking about HR, we have continuing education units. We have, you know, quarterly touch points for performance reviews and, and you know, education initiatives, mm-hmm. things like that. That's how you treat AI. I I evaluate my AI monthly. I do a performance review. I've built an entire matrix with critiques on a point system of how I evaluate my AI bots. Hmm. And if they have, you know, the AI hallucination that we're seeing right now, then I go back to programming them and training them. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you're teaching a course on that. That is one I'd love to come to. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, What is the best mentoring advice that you want to share with our listeners? I think the best mentoring advice goes back to creating that space within yourself for our mindset shift. We're, we're in an ever, you know, innovating, ever evolving, ever revolutionizing world. Change, you know, we, we hear it all the time, change is the only constant. But now we're at rapid change. Yeah. Um, and even those like myself who, you know, very flexible, love change, love to pivot, very agile, 
rapid change is a lot. So people, even myself, I had to do this, is we have to get ourselves, our headspace into a place where not only are we open to change, but learning. How do, how do we, you know, what do we do with this change? How do we incorporate it? How do we understand it? So I call it, you know, developing the strategic growth mindset. Um, and it's something that, you know, I've worked on for a number of years. I, I help a lot of my clients and partners and organizations I work with and developing to develop this understanding. So now it's almost like you have a new posture of strategic strategy and growth. Mm -hmm. You know, how can I use this new AI? Oh, well, this person I think is in a shoulder industry. How can we work together to, you know, go after this gap in our industry? Things like that. And how do we grow our business, you know, based off of, you know, these models? And so... Uh, I've seen that as a, actually a big gap um, in the industry is people talking about strategy and growth mindsets. So it ties back to that workbook that I recently published. Um, like I said, 10 weeks going through it, self-paced, um, very easy to work through. It's a lot of um, exercises, use cases, stories that I've learned over the years um, to create that space within ourselves to ha start developing that strategic growth mindset. Hmm. I like that quite a bit. So where can people find you? Uh, we usually give your website, mm -hmm. and then we'll use both websites. Uh, but then we also use your LinkedIn. Is there any other, like, do you have a YouTube channel or anything? No, right now it's my website and LinkedIn. Those are the main ones. Um, I have a newsletter on LinkedIn as well. So on my email list, I send out some great resources. Um, and then I host uh, bi-weekly. I post a new edition on my newsletter. It's called Growth and Grit. So it's talking about, uh, you know, all the, the hard work, the hustle, and the, the determination and endurance of being an entrepreneur um, combined with strategy and growth and new strategy models and, and, you know, growth tactics and things that most, you know, business owners don't think about. Uh, those are the things that I like to address. I think these were all really great resources that our listeners will get a lot out of. I hope that you are besieged with all kinds of inundated of people reaching out to you. Um, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on the show, and I look forward to seeing you at other events that are coming up. And then, of course, you know, maybe your show is going to be winning one of the top three most downloads at the end of this year. Oh, I hope for that. Absolutely. Yeah. Whoever gets the top three uh, most views on YouTube or the most the top three downloads comes back the next year as a guest, and oh, really? we do it all. Yeah, you get first, all right. second, you hear or that? third place. Yeah, yeah. vote yeah. for this guy. Yeah. Go over this guy. I want to come back next year. Okay. <laughs> All you got to do is start sharing it once your show airs. And your show is slated to air uh, March 5th. Perfect. Yeah. So we got a little bit of time here. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you to our sponsor, Cat5 Studios. And thank you to our video editing team, Max Stein, Luke Bellagia, and Chris Rodriguez. Music is by Sophie Lloyd. Visit Employers for Change at www.e4c.tech to learn how you can recruit, assess, and improve employee learning and company culture through DEI skills hiring and learning. Mention you listen to the show when you join and become a member and you may win a chance to be a guest on the Intern Whisper podcast. Subscribe today to our podcast and support the Intern Whisper by sharing leaving us comments and reviews. You can find the Intern Whisper podcast on Employers for Change YouTube channel or streaming from your favorite podcast channel.